up. We all consume media in some way, shape, or form. It may come as a surprise to you that you're doing that right now. As you might have noticed at one point or another, we tend to hear things a lot. And once we discovered how to have fun, we managed to use sounds to increase the immersion as far as fun levels in our favorite types of media go. But then, give it a few years, and now, we suddenly wanted it in our homes. So, we did it! Initially, we had to go for something that looked like a tuba, but hey, what are you gonna do? We just weren't advanced enough yet, but several decades later, we were. It was time to invent media consumption, again. It was up to Philips and Sony to pull it off, and they delivered. They made the Compact Disc. It was revolutionary for its time. When the CD was released in October of 1982 in Japan, it changed the game when it came to storing media. A lot of previous mediums went obsolete with the swing of the CD's hammer, but I guess at least vinyl still has something going for it. While most CDs don't store much by today's standards, it started with just around 10 megabytes in the 1980s. This was still pretty high tech for the time. When it was first available to the public, its main purpose is for music labels to throw albums onto and then sell them because, well, uh, you know, money. Eventually, people found out how to store videos on it, how to make it rewritable in case you made an oopsie, and even make it smaller because who doesn't want that? Then, on one fateful day, some video game company looked at a CD of theirs and then thought, hmm, what if we put games on it, and bam! TurboGrafx-16 CD-ROM add-on, yay! Once the mid-1990s hit, and even into the 2000s, the compact disc was the best storage medium for putting video games onto, usually with a few changes. Nintendo just had to wait a little before it could get into some of that action successfully. <laughs> some platforms opted for a CD-ROM, which is like a CD, but ROM. <gasps> What a CD-ROM is, it's basically pre-written with data which the device interacting with it can read, but it can't screw with the data itself. It's read-only. It's a no-no touch. Other consoles wanted to be cool, so they went with other customized disc-based formats. Usually, they were CDs but had some other tweaks to it, but I am willing to bet another reason was to stall piracy. So, a lot of these had their own take on copy protection. Over the course of time, we would be introduced to DVDs and then Blu-ray and then 4K Blu-ray, which seems to be the endgame of disk-based storage as of right now, which can store up to 100 gigabytes, if you have a triple layer disk, that is. But pfft, we don't care. If you've watched my channel before, you would probably know that I've always been more of a PlayStation guy than any other consoles I've seen. And at that, you know I'm gonna talk about it, right? You know the drill. The original PlayStation was one of those consoles that relied on one of the more common sub-format of CDs, the CD-ROM. But how does a PlayStation CD-ROM work exactly on the audio front? And how does the console itself help output that sound to your wonderful, precious ear holes? A lot of the game library relied on a set of tracks to implement their soundtracks. Traditional audio CDs, especially when it came to albums, also use tracks to separate every song from each other so that the user can switch between every track. If they were absent, all of the songs would play back to back all in one. It's just common sense, you know? A lot of the PlayStation 1 games borrowed this idea and separated their soundtracks with it as well. But hold up a second, if these games do a similar thing that audio CDs did, how come when you put one of these in a CD player and start with the first track, this happens? Oh yeah, I almost forgot. We need the data for the game itself. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Not every track on PlayStation discs are necessarily made for music. The game data itself is reserved for track 1 on every disc. This is applied to other consoles of the time as well, like the Dreamcast. Game data is not necessarily made to follow music theory, but there are noise artists out there that can prove otherwise. Hey, anything is possible! But then again, that's the audio CD part. If we need to hear what music we put onto this thing, we should probably have the hardware to make that happen too. Come on, this is technology we're dealing with. Of course it's rocket science. 
Now, as embarrassing as this may sound, this part needs a disclaimer. Even though I wish I was, I am not an expert on the components of the PlayStation 1 or what types of files it uses. It's almost like this is why we research these things so we then have the knowledge of the ins and outs of things. No worries, I did. Trust me on this one. Documentation is a lifesaver. If any corrections are pointed out, they will be in the description of the video when I have the time to. Other than that, what are we waiting for? I got glasses for a reason. So I think it's time to listen to the furry nerds speak. There are two chips that make the sound on the PlayStation possible, the SPU and its DRAM. The placements of these chips differ from many different motherboards that models of the PlayStation have been through. For example, let's take a look at the PU7 board, which was used in earlier models, such as the Japanese SCPH-1000, where the CPU is located on IC-308 of the board, and the DRAM is located in IC-310. But in this case, we will not be paying attention to where these chips are located, but more so what they do. In the absolute simplest terms, the SPU processes sound, just like the name suggests. But that answer is too boring. We should probably think of it in another way. Think of the SPU like it's a mini sound card. Audio signals are handled through a series of inputs and outputs, meaning what goes into the card from the computer software must come out through a sound device such as headphones and speakers. In the earlier days of sound chips and cards, it was important to know how many voices it was capable of producing and outputting to however many channels it could output from. But real quick, what is a voice? Well, think of it like this. When a sample is played, it is important to have it assigned to a voice to which it can be played out of. This helps for the case when multiple samples are meant to be played simultaneously. In the 1980s, a lot of the stuff we got for computer sound synthesis usually got as high as 3 to 4 voices, roughly, from either mono or stereo. But a lot of computers didn't know what that meant, so we just went with beep boop beep beep boop and called it a day. As for now, the number of voices doesn't really matter anymore, because it is now possible to focus on how many speakers we can buy with our student loan, also known as surround sound, which has too many channels to count in some cases. Before we get into the specifications of the sound chips of the PlayStation, perhaps we should introduce the ADPCM format of sound. We would also have to compare another format of audio, regular old PCM. PCM stands for Pulse Code Modulation, and it's usually more direct when it comes to encoding data for the audio file. Typically, people use this for most WAV files, as a lot of the default formats used for WAV encoding may use PCM to get the job done. Although, of course, other options are also available. PCM is purely uncompressed audio, so you get the true cut, real deal audio from a file like this. Since the inception of PCM, people have found a way to take out the UN from uncompressed and make entirely new formats that can shrink the file size because whatever. That leads us to our second format for comparison, ADPCM. The general purpose of ADPCM, or Adaptive Differential Pulse Code Modulation, is to be one of many ways to compress an audio file like WAV, which may sound strange for this type of file at first because we tend to typically use WAV for uncompressed formats. But how does it compress audio exactly? Well, it interprets 16-bit audio samples in a way that can be encoded to 4 bits instead. That results in roughly a fourth of the original PCM audio file size. Now that is pretty decent compression. What could possibly be its secret as to how to compress it this way? The answer? It guesses, uh, I mean, it predicts. It has a specific name to it as well. It's called the Adapted Value Predictor. What happens is that a sample is inputted and is then compared to some previous estimates. It will then calculate the difference between them and use the step size to determine where the next sample in the audio should be. Using this new audio sample, the step size is updated. The encoder accepts the difference of the samples and then goes on a loop until the finished audio file is complete. The world of gaming loved this format, 
many, many consoles used a variation of ADPCM formats. The PS1, PS2, PS3, PS Vita, Sega Dreamcast, the original Xbox, and uh, quite a few more. In the PlayStation, this format was used for the creation of VAG format files, which is the format used to be contained within VB and VH files. More on that momentarily. I think we're done with that. Wait! Not so fast. You thought I was gonna stop at 80 PCM? No! There's more to it than you think. The PlayStation is capable of understanding two different subformats of 80 PCM audio data. One of these is just straight up SPU 80 PCM, and the other is XA 80 PCM. Both of these subformats have their own advantages and disadvantages. Let's start with XA80 PCM, as it's a little bit easier to understand than the former. XA80 PCM relies on data that is stored on a disk that is strictly XA files, or is otherwise encoded in XA format. Sometimes that could apply to music if it doesn't loop. Other sound formats would be needed to loop music. The advantage of having this format is that it doesn't need to rely on an external source for it to be stored. Because, you know... <coughs> That means the SPU can decode this data on the fly and throw it directly into the audio mixer for output. But it's not all fine and dandy when it comes to doing this practice, however. Because of the architecture, it cannot be looped, and worst of all, can only be played in a limited number of sample rate choices. What a tragedy! How will we ever have the ability to play it at more fine tune rates? This is where we introduce the SPU ADPCM subformat. The short version of it, SPU ADPCM is everything that XA ADPCM isn't. It can loop, and can reverb, and can play through voices on the SPU to make all of that work, but of course, it needs SPU DRAM for storage. This is where the VAG and VAB formats come in. Remember those? There are also a few more formats like STR for full motion video. Sequenced music is also often featured in PlayStation games, although formats tend to vary. Those are, arguably, personally speaking, reserved for another day. And VB seems to be more on topic for the moment, so... A VAG file contains data for a single sound in the game. It's like an everyday sound file in a way, essentially, kind of. And you also have the VAB format, which is a set of one VB and one VH file. With a VB file, think of it like a bunch of VAG files just glued together, and then give it a different extension so the console can tell apart the two. That's kind of what a VB file is. Since a single VB file has all of these sounds in it, we would have to separate them so that they all don't play one by one as a single sound. This is why the VB file separates them into different sounds. Don't believe me? See for yourself, because I'm going to import this VB file into Tenacity via raw data as best as I can. Okay, okay, okay. Let me explain. Maybe that wasn't a good idea, because Tenacity, or any other fork of Audacity, doesn't have the correct format for this. One thing to remember is that the PlayStation has a special format of ADPCM that is made specifically for PlayStation audio files, because, duh, a lot of consoles did this. But at least, if you listen closely enough... You can faintly hear Vibri speaking. I could kind of prove that she was there, right? I'd advise you to use P-Sound for PlayStation Sound Extraction. Trust me, you will get infinitely better results. The maximum number of sounds that one of these can have is 254 VAG format sounds. Now that we have the sounds themselves, we have to get some header data. This is where the VH file comes in. The VH file defines a whole ton of things, including, but are not limited to, VAG count, identification, waveform size, and such. This is the dynamic duo that will get the job done if the game utilizes them. Okay, so right off the bat, this is a lot to take in. 
A game console like this one almost always uses a different format using different file extensions, which would therefore require the hackers of the console to develop tools specifically to encode the raw files into a playable format like WAV, which allows for people to use as sound effects in their videos like this. Now, I think we should go back into the motherboard to take another look at the chips of the motherboard of the console, aka switch focus to the SPU itself, to see how sound is processed exactly, because the name of the component stands for what it does isn't nearly good enough for me. Time to get my imaginary magnifying glass. If you remember from earlier in the video, a voice in a sound chip is like a channel which a sound can pass through. Especially in the older days of computers, there were a limited number of these. And when it gets low enough, people have to get creative with their sound. It's why things like tracked music exist. This problem is not quite as pronounced for the PlayStation, and we're about to see why. Now that we have a basis of what a voice is, and what type of sound is able to be played on the console, we can now go into what exactly the sound specifications were for the original PlayStation sound processing unit. During the console's lifespan, there have been many types of SPU chips that have been manufactured for it, but thankfully, they all have similar specifications for our purposes. Well, how many does it have exactly? It has 24 which is more than enough for most games of the time period. It is also stereo sound, meaning it is capable of producing sound made for the left or right ear. As far as how each voice works, each one is capable of playing SPU ADPCM audio. Each of the 24 voices in the PlayStation's PSU can be served for a variety of purposes. Along with the formats of sound data that we have mentioned before, we are also able to produce pure noise out of it, which can be played at any sample rate. Speaking of sample rate, this is applied to regular samples too. Both the noise and the samples in the game files themselves have no set sample rate to play at. What are you? This is because it is pure ADPCM data and nothing else. So it is up to one of the voices in the SPU to figure out what speed is exactly the correct speed to play at. To define this, a value of <sighs> is used, where 1000 in hexadecimal, also known as 4096 in base 10, is equivalent to 44,100 hertz. And in case you were wondering, yes, I made an equation for it because, shut up, 4000H, or 16384 is the highest pitch setting a sample can be played at, which is equivalent to 176,400 hertz. Ignoring this, FFFFH would be the highest that the code can even support, which is roughly 705.589233 kilohertz. And that's not all for the voices of the SPU, because they're also able to apply other wacky effects to the audio passing through it, which was actually kind of an early application of such practice. Uh-huh, it's not just pitch, it wouldn't be for a pretty decent length before technology using special effects on the fly like this would be commonplace. For perspective, this was 1994. Now it's just easy. Like, look at all that Vegas can do now. One of the things that it can do was add a digital reverb. When it comes to how it works, I am not entirely sure if I can even begin to explain what's going on here. These are the addresses it relies on to make it happen. And this is the formula. <clears throat> I'll try. In simplified terms, there are a series of steps that it has to go through in order to achieve the effect. A few of these steps is multiplying the input volume and incoming audio data together, and doing some echo stuff while reflecting it across both the left and right audio channels. Trust me, this is a lot to take in. The amount of abbreviated terms is just too much for me. Bottom line, it goes through this process to generate pleasing reverb results. Here is a simpler one that I can handle. Looping, 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 loop. Well yeah, it's kinda just that. It's almost as simple as it sounds, although it would still be worth mentioning a few key things when it comes to looping a sample from SPU ADPCM data. This looping system is actually kinda flawed, however, because once it plays, it's gonna keep playing, and playing, and playing. So yeah, that's a thing. It doesn't stop until something else is played through the voice. 
A common remedy to have these samples stop is to play back some type of dummy data. Doing that, no sound will be produced until it needs to once more. But usually, this isn't an annoyance to players, because for one, fading out samples is a thing. It's pretty genius, but it leaves me to wonder why the PlayStation's PSU didn't add the ability to stop loops by default. I don't know, just kind of a thought I had. Of course, endpoints for when the sample is set to loop can also be set. You know, just in case, right? To give you some perspective, the BIOS file does this for its chime sound. Some of the more tech-savvy viewers might want to ask, Hey, there's still a few details that computer sound needs to work properly. Like, um, I don't know, an audio buffer? Uh, yes, that was exactly what I was going to say. And you would be right. You might notice this chip here. In fact, this also helps with proper sound processing. What is that, though? If you have been paying attention thus far, it is its DRAM, of course. Yeah, I almost forgot. Sound processing has to rely on a special type of RAM. Because, of course it does. Everything has RAM. Your brain has RAM. My video has RAM. Even this cake has RAM. And it doesn't even taste good. <laughs> um, right. For instance, some chips on the board have to store temporary things specialized for it to save for later. Which would explain why some components in the console have these specialized RAM chips. The SPU is by no means an exception. It has this rule applied to it as well. As this wonderful gentleman has mentioned before, the console's sound output is also helped in part by the SPU's DRAM, also known as SPU memory, which takes up 512 kilobytes, by the way. It can act as an audio buffer for the main SPU. It is also open to, and often used by, two other components, the CPU via direct memory access and the CD controller. Inside of what goes on in that DRAM chip, almost all of the 512 kilobytes is reserved for storing SPU ADPCM samples to be used in the game you are playing. Note that I did say almost, because the actual amount of space it takes up is 508 kilobytes, because the remaining 4 kilobytes are used for a different purpose, that being reserved by the SPU itself. What it uses it for is to process music from the audio that is stored from the CD. As far as that stuff goes, that is about it for the DRAM chip. It does what it does. And with all of that, it goes out into the output, and then goes to your audio device, so that you can hear that sweet, sweet audio. On the technical front, that just about covers it. The chips and all. But we will discuss one more thing. I think we need an example to see this type of thing in action. I suppose it would be interesting to mention how the BIOS kind of pushes on the PSU's capabilities a bit. No, I'm not saying it is too intensive for what is deemed necessary, really. I more so mean that it shows what it is capable of. A lot of the things I showcased in this video so far, the ability to loop SPU ADPCM samples to reverb those samples, the voices it has, etc., are extremely utilized in the startup sequence. It's just beautiful. But first, we need some type of visualization so that we can tell what the hell is going on here. Luckily, DuckStation has a lot of debug features. Under this tab here, we can show the state of the SPU here. To give you a quick tour of this little drop-down, status, monitors any direct memory access routines, and master volume percentages, voice state does exactly what it sounds like it does. We know that these are all 24 of the voices, but what is all of this gibberish? Next to each voice channel number, interpolation and sample index are monitored, along with any looping endpoints, what part of the audio data is playing, what sample rate it is playing at, the volume of left and right channels, and ADSR details, including what phase it is currently in. ADSR means attack, decay, sustain, and release, by the way. If you are into audio mixing in a DAW or something, then you might know what I am talking about. Next is the Reverb tab. The most important parts of this tab monitor whether it is enabled at all, what channels are allowed to use it when it is enabled, and how loud the effect will be. There's also pitch modulation here for some reason. Guess they couldn't fit it anywhere else, uh, but I'm digressing. Lastly is the Hacks tab. It does this. Wow. 
first thing of note is that the BIOS needs a whopping three different sounds in order to do its startup and post-disc post -disc read sequence. First, the chimes again. You know what? Off topic for a second, because these chimes have some weird ability. What's that ability, you ask? It's the ability to be creepy for no reason. It's even worse if you slow it down. Okay, okay, I've lost enough sleep already. Let's just move on. Secondly, this reverse glass breaking sound that gets cut off in the middle. Why? Likely space constraints. Lastly, a synth. Ah, beautiful. Okay, so we have our sounds. Now what? We gotta sequence it. But here's the thing. This is another situation where it's hard to tell what they used exactly. Again, games and even the BIOS tend to use vast varieties of formats to sequence their music. Otherwise, a common format for these is SEQ and SEP, which is not what the BIOS uses. What it uses is proprietary. Moving on, another thing the BIOS's sound sequence does is a lot of reverb. And when I say that, I really mean it. It reverbs a lot. So much so that there is a point during the process from boot to game that has every single SPU voice's reverb flag enabled. All 24. That should say so enough. Other than the logos, the BIOS also provides a CD player, so we can see what the SPU will do with our CD audio data. Let's insert a disc. As you can see, nothing lights up. This means no voices are being used. Just like before, this is essentially streaming raw data from the disc itself, so it can be sent directly to the audio mixer without needing to use an SPU voice channel. As for looping, it's as easy to spot as just looking at hexadecimal numbers for a while, really. It can be observed with the sound, as shown here as it returns to a set smaller number at a constant rate. Enjoying your time here so far in purgatory? That's great to hear. Thankfully for you, this marks the end of the video. Future follow-up videos regarding sound use in the PlayStation 1 will relay some of the information mentioned in this video. In the future, I also want to explore how Vibribbon uses multiple VAG format files to create variation to save space. Before I go, I also want to mention that I admit to any mistakes that may appear in the video, so if you want to make any corrections, please provide information about that in the comments so I can relay it to the description. Until my next video, probably just gonna go ahead and, uh, I don't know, procrastinate? Bye.